Okay, so today we're talking books because I get a lot of questions about these bookshelves. Number one, where are they from? CB2. Number two, what's on them? Will you share your books? What are you reading right now? What are your favorite books? Things like that. And please, please guys, don't force me to talk about my favorite books. I would be thrilled. My dream job is to be a personal library curator. Like tell me about yourself and I will form your best dream library for you. But until someone hires me to do that, I will be talking about my dream library, which is slowly growing behind me. I will be honest, there are books everywhere. And that is how I like to fill my house because I love to bring in lovely, beautiful ideas. And if you are watching this, you probably are one of those moms too. And so today I've pulled some books. We're gonna start a whole mother culture series, I suppose. Now that I've said it, we'll do it. But I'm going to be talking somewhat regularly about the books that I love, the books that have shaped my thoughts, my affections, my actions in my home, because I will repeat until the end of time, I myself am not this like amazingly wise person. I benefit greatly from the wisdom of those before me. I read deeply, I read widely, and part of that is that I can stand on the shoulders of people who have already thought deeply about these things, taking what they've learned, avoiding hopefully the blind spots that they had or that they point out that I have, and can continue on with meeting the, the greats face to face, as C.S. Lewis says. And so today we're going to start with the books I think you should read when you are at the beginning of your classical Charlotte Mason homeschooling journey. These are some of the books that I read then, some that I wish I would have read back then, and each one is not, is, is not reaching too far back into the past in terms of you are picking up Plato. However, they do build upon those lovely ideas of people like St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Basil, St. John Chrysostom, all those guys. There are plenty of books, many books that you should read, but these books have been picked specifically for a reason, and I'm gonna talk through them. That was the longest intro ever. I'm, I'm trying to figure out what order I wanna do them, and this is very important to me to do this the right way. So I think what I'll do is the one that helps you catch the vision first, which would be, for the children's sake, by Susan Schaefer Macaulay. This is one that you 100% have already heard of if you are even an inch into the Charlotte Mason world because it is the book that the generation before me that kind of brought Mason into the homeschooling world in America um, because this has been happening for a while, Mason in America. They, a lot of them fell through their wardrobe with this book. And it's a great book to get to catch the vision. So if you're kind of wondering, how does this look in real life? What is education supposed to be? How do Christians think of a person? Catching that larger vision before you try to dive into all the specifics, this would be an excellent book. I'm going to link all these below, so they'll be really easy for you to get. But for the children's sake, Susan Schaefer Macaulay will walk you through how she discovered Mason, how she started implementing her principles, what a healthy child looks like, like what kind of an imagination kind of shows that your kid is healthy and being fed mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, um, different things like that, and then gives a celebration of life and education on the whole. And so this is not, like if you are someone who's watching and you're like, oh, I'm not really sure yet about Mason, this might sell you on it for sure, but this could also be applied just to your home life. So even if you're not a home educator, this book will give you a beautiful vision. Now the next one is You Are What You Left by James K. Smith. Um, I talk about this book all the time through The Commonplace. It's been on my footnotes, it's been in my newsletter. In fact, I recommend it as one of the first three books if you only have a little bit of time to read. And that is because we, hello, you and me, are post-enlightenment women. We are in our time and place and therefore we believe that reason and the individual are kind of king. It's just part of our culture, part of our time and place. And that is because of the enlightenment. In education, one of the big fundamental shifts that needs to happen in your mind is that you are not primarily, and your child is not primarily, a thinking thing. The phrase brain on stick comes from James K. Smith in this. You are not just a brain walking around a stick. It actually does matter that you do more than just think. That's an encouragement we hear a lot across the Christian world. It doesn't really matter what you do as long as you think about Jesus or you think about this thing. But we're not just brains. We're full embodied people. We have imaginations. We have appetites. We have judgment. We have reason. We have all these different things that work together, including our physical bodies, which embody in God's world the things we think about and things we love. And so in this book, James K. Smith will flip upside down that you are not a thinking thing, you are a loving thing. Your actual primary orientation in the world is what you see as the good life, the flourishing life. And whatever you believe that is, whatever kingdom you think that is, you will continue to move towards that. No matter, it's not that your rational brain doesn't matter, obviously, but even if you tell yourself what you think is right, what you're actually loving is what's pulling you in your life. And so, I mean, we all know that's true, right? But this book will kind of walk through. He has a more academic version of this in a three-part series beginning with Desiring the Kingdom, which is really good, but this is a great way to start. So I highly recommend this book. Next would be a book that I think you should read every single year, The Abolition of Man by C.S. Lewis. If you do not want to read it in this form, you can just read the Space Trilogy or the Chronicles of Narnia because that is the story form of this book. So it's a very small book. Um, 
you need to read it many times to fully get it. So I'm only gonna pick out a couple of things that I think are most important for you to know right now. Lewis will make the case that universal values are important, things like courage and honor and duty. Um, and he will break down what society was doing at this time, which is so interesting when you read something so prophetic for your time, but it was just getting worse. And he talks about how the way we, the way they were living then and the way we were living now is actually destroying the chest within men or women. We no longer um, understand these real, true, good, and beautiful things that we ought to love and we ought to pursue. And in doing that, by mocking them, by forgetting them, by erasing them or rewriting them, then we look around and ask why no one is lovely and noble. Why don't people stand up for others? Why don't people pursue the truth? Why do people go crazy online or in real life? Um, and then we ask, well, why aren't they honorable? Well, it's because we've completely destroyed the idea of honor. And so C.S. Lewis will walk through universal principles, finding what is true, and then what are the impacts and the effects till eventually you no longer have people. Generation after generation, when you act as a manipulator, when you act as a master of nature, which was never supposed to be our position as God's people in his creation, instead we're supposed to be encounters, we're supposed to be worshipers, we're supposed to be stewards, not supposed to be masters and manipulators, which is how we operate in the postmodern world that we live in. And in doing that, we are actually destroying people. So what does that look like? Okay, this one right here is 10 ways to destroy your child's imagination. Oh, the imagination of your child, sorry. 10 ways to destroy the imagination of your child by Anthony Eslin. And this is written a la screw tape style. So it's written from the enemy's perspective. Like one of the points will be, do not let your children play outside. Is that, a, it, like they used to call it air, I think is the actual name of the, the title, but we're gonna look. Keep your children indoors as much as possible. So it's written from the enemy's perspective. And he goes through and he basically points out the many flaws of contemporary parenthood. The ways our, the ways our children are being raised, the types of childhood they're having, and then he makes a case in this very witty, fun, like, enemy style of what children should be doing, right? That they should understand what honor is, what love is, what friendship is, what duty is, how you, a child's imagination is formed, how they should play outside, they should have risk, they should not have adult intervention in their games, different things like that. And so just kind of reclaiming what childhood should be, which is incredibly important for the formation of a person because childhood is a God-ordained time and there are healthy ways and rhythms to to enter into with children and they need that. And so this book is very good. I have had quite a few discussions with friends about, is he too pretentious in this? I'll be honest. I say yes, some say no, but um, the book itself is very good. Okay, so I was flipping through to, to find something else, but then I got caught by, oh, there goes my camera, uh, level distinctions between man and woman. like remove the mystery of what is a man, what is a woman to the opposite gender, right? Like we should always be a little like, I don't totally understand you, um, but, he has this great part right here where he says, feed young people enough of that, the idea that men are not worth looking for and women are not worth looking for, and you will go far towards making souls incapable of imagining any real virtue at all. They will be wiser than all that traditional rot and for our purposes, more manageable. So we really do handicap our children with many of the ways that they are being raised today. Beauty and the Word by Stratford Caldecott. So once you've kind of made your way in and you've started to hear about the liberal arts, the, three, the first three liberal arts, which are grammar, logic, and rhetoric, you may start to fall into the neoclassical movement, which pairs those three liberal arts with ages and stages. I think it's a travesty. I'm going to link to my episode this season where I talk about curriculum and what Mason says a curriculum should be and therefore what the great tradition is versus what neoclassicism is. Um, but within this book, it's re rethinking the foundations of education. Uh, Caldecott goes through and he answers the questions that I'm always asking. What is a good education? What is it for? And in this, Caldecott takes a different approach with the three liberal arts. He actually forms them into like a Trinitarian model where I believe it's be, think, and speak with three tools. And he, he brings them into a much fuller, more beautiful picture of what a full person is, how a person ought to live in God's world, what education should do to the person. And then he actually brings in Charlotte Mason at the end of this book. Um, and it's really lovely. You start to see how Mason fits in larger tradition and you start to see that it's not just your kid's a pole pair, your kid's a pert, your kid's a poetic, if you know about that. Um, it's not just shove facts in your child as quickly as you can. It's this all of life sort of mentality. And actually, I think Anthony Eslin, the guy from the last book, writes the forward in here as well. So you're starting to see how they're all connected. And then the last book is The Whole Brain Child. This is not an education book at all. However, it is a great book for understanding how your child's brain is developing, which is a tool every parent needs when you are working on things like training a will, training reason, training uh, habits 
being kind to your children, things like that. And so I do recommend this book. It's just by secular psychologist, again, not an education book, but will be incredibly helpful. In fact, in my next video, we're talking about the way of the reason because we just finished that on the podcast. And we're going to talk a little bit about upstairs brain and downstairs brain, how those work in the early years and what you can do to help support your child as they learn. I think you should buy them all or get them from the library and enjoy entering into the waters. They will give you the vision, they will give you some beginning foundational ideas, and then from there you can build and really jump into kind of, you know, the big books. I mean, you need to read Mason herself. Please don't ever just take what you find on the internet for Mason. You need to read Mason herself. I highly recommend the liberal arts tradition. If you want to dive in from the classical philosopher side, of course, Mason herself, and then you'll have Karen Glass, Cindy Rollins, uh, Brandy Wenzel, other women from the Charlotte Mason side who kind of tie her in in a really lovely way. So I hope that's helpful. If you have any questions about these books, let me know below. Otherwise, I will see you next time when we talk about The Way of the Reason.